Welcome, everyone. Thanks very much for joining. My name is Bill Callery. I'm Manager of Programs and Knowledge Exchange at the Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance of Canada, or CDPAC. And I'm going to be co-moderating this webinar with Victoria Otterman. And I'll introduce Victoria in just a few moments. So for those of you who aren't familiar with CDPAC, we're a network of many of Canada's largest national healthy living and disease prevention organizations who've come together to work on promotion of healthy living. We've got our website, our social media contents uh, at the bottom of the slide, so I encourage you to connect with us. You can sign up to uh, receive our newsletters, check out our past events and upcoming events uh, online. So today's webinar is part of a series of webinars um, that we've been working with the Public Health Agency of Canada Centre for Chronic Disease Prevention, and it's entitled Bringing to Pass a Modernized Surveillance System Expanding Physical Activity Reporting to Incorporate Sedentary Behaviour and Sleep. So this webinar is going to review the process undertaken by the Public Health Agency to broaden the scope of physical activity surveillance and reporting to include sedentary behaviour sedentary behavior and sleep behaviors, as well as their risk and protective factors. So we're really pleased to be bringing you the webinar and uh, also look forward to continuing to bring webinars uh, in partnership with the Public Health Agency over the coming year. I'm going to be now introducing our Q&A moderator, Victoria Otterman, on the left side of your screen. Uh, Victoria is going to introduce uh, our presenters today, and she's also going to be chairing questions and discussion following the presentation. Vicky is an analyst, a research analyst with the Public Health Agency of Canada's Surveillance and Epidemiology team. So over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Bill. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the presenters are pleased to be sharing with you the agency's work on the development of the physical activity Sedentary Behavior and Sleep Indicator Framework, also known as PASS. Our first presenter is Dr. Gaia J. Araman. Gaia is the Chief of the Behavioral and Environmental Surveillance Team in the Surveillance and Epidemiology Division. Our next presenter, Karen, is a Senior Epidemiologist with the Surveillance and Epidemiology Division. And our final presenter, Erin, is an Epidemiologist with the Surveillance and Epidemiology Division. And now I will hand things off to Gaia. Hey, so, so thank you everyone for taking the time from your busy schedules to join us. We're really excited to be sharing with you some of the work that we've been undertaking over the past little over two years, I now think, on um, physical activity modernization. Just uh, to clarify that the work presented today is really going to be surveillance focused and it's really intended to align all the current evidence that we know about um, which speak to all forms of movement and their impact on chronic disease prevention. For those of you who've joined us on previous CDPAC um, webinars, you might be familiar with the work as we presented it on the Chronic Disease Indicator Framework as well as Positive Mental Health, um, both of which are available on our info base. You can just Google that if you're interested. But really the themes are quite similar in the sense that we are um, – better trying to unpack what the core indicators and measures are for our various outcomes programs of interest across the lifespan by applying a socioecological lens to the work that we do. So we're very, very excited to be sharing with you the work as it, um, not just the process, but where we're at today. Um, I do want to end, though, by thanking um, the numerous people who've been involved in this process because we've undergone fairly um, dramatic um, input changes, et cetera, based on the valuable input from our technical colleagues as well as experts. I hope that a lot of you are on the line. If you are, you know who you are. Thank you very much for your inputs. I want to also specifically um, mention the, the provinces and territories in the context of the Physical Activity Recreation Committee, whose inputs were very valuable in informing this work. And then um, more locally, want to acknowledge the work of uh, Greg Butler on, on the team who's not able to join us today, Erin, and particularly Karen Roberts, who you'll be hearing from shortly, who's been quite a motor in moving this work forward. Finally, Bill and colleagues at CDPAC, without whom obviously we wouldn't be here. It's been an excellent partnership. And so uh, without further ado, over to you, Karen. Thank you, guys. So I'm just going to jump right into uh, the presentation here and start by giving a bit of an overview of physical activity surveillance in Canada, and it's a very rapid overview. Uh, so just bringing or a quick reminder that the intention of any surveillance system is to provide the information necessary to inform effective public health action. 
And Canada's physical activity surveillance system has long been recognized internationally for its comprehensiveness and effectiveness in advancing uh, public health policy and practice. Uh, but this system did not emerge overnight. Uh, the system has evolved over time, you know, looking back as far as the Lalonde report, which established the basis, or we could say established the basis for the system by providing a framework of key factors that determine health status, uh, which included biology, but also brought in physical activity as a key element of uh, or contributing to health. It also described the environments and the health services that impact them. Uh, in Canada in the mid-1990s, as many of you are probably aware, the Physical Activity and Sport Monitoring Program was established, and this was a federal, provincial, territorial, or FPT collaboration, which worked to identify key indicators that, that were going to be used to track and, and report on physical activity and sport, and, and with the intention that it would be possible to report on progress in these areas. Uh, stemming out of this collaboration, there's been the development of many, many different uh, data sources to report on physical activity, including self-reported surveys, uh, some of which included objective measures, uh, as well as specific population and setting-based uh, surveys. So my next slide here, a bit of a, a visual for showing I guess the development of many of the key physical activity data sources that we have relied upon at the agency for our reporting at the national level. So what it does not include are, again, subnational level surveys, population specific surveys, and other data sources that have been used uh, in order to report on physical activity. I'm going to hand things over to Erin. Following Karen's historical overview on physical activity surveillance in Canada, I'd like to present over the next few slides some of the federal, provincial, territorial actions, as well as the evidence that have supported the expansion of physical activity reporting to include sedentary behavior and sleep. Beginning about two decades ago, as you can see on this slide, uh, with the advent of the FPT physical activity and sport monitoring program in 1995, and then following 10 years later, the 2005 Integrated Pan-Canadian Healthy Living Strategy, reporting was largely focused on moderate to vigorous levels of intensity of physical activity during an individual's leisure time. Since this time, evidence emerged that other levels of intensity of physical activity, as well as sedentary behavior, were also important factors impacting health. So the next bar on my slide, starting in 2010, there was a need to expand the agency's reporting from just leisure time, uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity, to different types of physical activity, as well as sedentary behavior and their upstream determinants with the announcement of the FPT framework to curb childhood obesity and the release of physical activity and sedentary behavior guidelines in uh, 2011 and 2012. The FPT Curbing Childhood Obesity Framework identified the need to make the environment supportive of physical activity. New indicators on physical activity and sanitary behavior were also required to better inform adherence to guidance. Now, my last bar on the slide shows that in the years following the release of the FPT Curbing Childhood Obesity Framework, work was conducted to identify uh, surveillance indicators to inform the actions to support this change. This resulted in uh, in progress reports that were released in 2013 and 2015 on advancing this FPT framework on healthy weight. In these progress reports, sleep was added based on evidence showing its link to healthy weight. So, as this slide summarizes, as a result of the growing body of literature over the years that all behaviors along the movement continuum contribute to health, there was a need by the agency to better harmonize reporting on physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep and their upstream determinants. Because physical activity was expanded to, to include sedentary behavior, um, I wanted to show with this slide some of the evidence uh, of its negative consequences on health. As this slide shows in the first bullet, sedentary behavior is defined as any activity involving little physical activity movement and low energy use while sitting or lying down. Examples include sitting in front of a computer or TV, driving a car, as well as sitting at a desk or cubicle at school or work. When a person is engaged in a sedentary pursuit, the functioning of their body changes. 
As in the next bullet shows, the term inactivity physiology describes the research on the potential causal role of sedentary behaviors in the development of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. Because of the physiological effects of prolonged sitting, sedentary behavior is a risk factor for a number of poor, poor health outcomes in children and adults that is independent of physical activity. And some of these health outcomes are listed on this slide. For example, an individual can still be considered physically active but can still compromise their health if they sit for long, prolonged periods of time at school, work, or home, as well as during transport. Moving on to sleep, I wanted to show with this slide um, that there's also been an emerging evidence, there has also been emerging evidence on the health impacts of sleep. In the past, the importance of sleep has mostly centered on its well-established links to mental health, cognition, and safety. Sleep was often thought of to be of the brain, by the brain, and for the brain. However, current knowledge is expanding that insufficient or disturbed sleep may play an important role in the development of obesity and chronic disease. And what I wanted to show with the two uh, boxes on this slide um, is the transition in public health from addressing only sleep disorders towards optimizing sleep duration and quality. The terms sleep health and sleep hygiene are relatively new concepts but there have been definitions as well as measures proposed that are illustrated on this slide. Thank you, Erin. And so delving into the meat of the presentation today, which is true really to describe the process that was undertaken by the agency to identify a set of indicators that we hope will form the foundation of the agency's physical activity surveillance activities moving forward. So the motivation for this work has certainly been multi-pronged. Uh, but a need to create efficiencies really was one of the strongest drivers. So as I showed earlier, Canada's many different data sources for physical activity at a national level. And although our physical activity data is rich, we seem to be encountering some limitations in our ability to speak to, to some of the agency's new and emerging priorities. Um, and especially those related to sedentary behavior, sleep, as well as uh, the supportive environments that Erin mentioned. Uh, obviously, there's always a push to do more with fewer resources and streamlining our surveillance expenditures, ensuring we were getting good value for taxpayers' dollars was, as always, identified as being important. Uh, and with so many competing sources of data, there, we were starting to run into concerns that there was duplication or overlap between some sources as well as an underutilization of others. Uh, but rather than doing some piecemeal cutting, we wanted to be sure that we, we took an approach that would make the most of our current funding envelopes and, and really that would ultimately leave us with the most relevant information possible for policy and program development. So these drivers together really led to direction from our senior management to take a step back and appraise our current practices for physical activity surveillance and then to plot a way forward. So um, just around the same time we began this work, there was an FPT directive from uh, the Deputy Ministers of Sport, Physical Activity and Recreation, which also called for the review of the Physical Activity and Sport Monitoring Program. And that was, again, with a view to, to modernizing the physical activity data collection that was being done. Uh, but the, the development of our, our past indicators or the selection of these indicators and the development of this framework was also undertaken uh, in such a way that it would hopefully help, uh, help the agency to better participate in that FPT process. So why develop an indicator framework? Uh, as mentioned by Gaia, the past indicator framework represents one of several uh, indicator frameworks that have been developed by the agency in recent years. Some of you may have been in attendance in the webinar that was part of this series just a few weeks ago, which described the recent release of our positive mental health indicator framework. Uh, there's also our broader chronic disease and injury indicator framework, uh, which has been online and updated annually since 2013, uh, most recently just a few months ago. And again, if you uh, search online for FAC chronic disease uh, info base, uh, you'll have access to both of those indicator frameworks. But a common goal of these frameworks as well as the PASS is in order, is I guess to identify or to establish a comprehensive set of evidence-informed indicators that we can use as the basis for regular surveillance reporting. Uh, 
being very cognizant of the fact that it's important that information be readily available in order for it to be used. Uh, developing the framework was obviously felt to be an important first step in us to update our physical activity or our approach to physical activity surveillance, uh, especially when there was an interest to broaden the focus beyond physical activity to include sedentary behavior and sleep, as well as the supportive environments, and a growing push that the, our indicators be reflective of a, a socio-ecological approach. So routine, routine, routine reporting on the indicators across all these domains uh, was hoped to allow the agency to better respond to its emerging uh, priorities and to support our program and, and policy development. So as you'll hear more later on, our selection of indicators uh, was not bound to the availability of, of the data, and this was very much by design. A key intention of our framework was to inform our ongoing work not only for reporting, but also for the development of new surveillance methods and for techniques in order to address gaps that might exist. Uh, I'm going to keep coming back to this schematic, uh, which describes a little bit the indicator framework development process. So we started by developing a conceptual framework, which was to help guide the selection of our indicators and ensure that we were touching on the areas of greatest uh, priority. So at the outset, our conceptual framework was actually just a series of concentric triangles, uh, but we later developed it into this lovely schematic, which you, which you see now. Uh, and again, just reiterating, this was designed as a, for organizing principles. So the conceptual framework reports on daily physical activities through several lenses. Uh, first, we looked at the spectrum of physical activity, uh, or sorry, the spectrum of movement, uh, ranging from moderate to vigorous physical activity, light physical activity, and sedentary behavior, and all the way to sleep. Uh, some of our initial discussions around the conceptual frame, whether or not sleep, uh, whether or question whether or not sleep should be considered a movement behavior or whether it should be a foundational element for health. But in the end, we decided to place it alongside the other movement intensities. The second lens we applied was to examine the environments in which individuals undertake these activities. So we examined the home environment, work and school, depending on the age group in question, the community environments, and the community environment. And because Canadians travel between these environments, the transportation environment was also added. So these environments or locations of activity uh, were chosen being very cognizant that we wanted to be consistent with the four environments identified for global physical activity surveillance. So for those of you who might be, uh, may be more familiar with that, they spoke to leisure time physical activity, occupational or school, uh, housework, and the transportation environment. Finally, a socio-ecological model was applied, uh, and this was to try and expand our reporting focus beyond just individual level factors like behaviors. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we were including social environments like family and peer influences, uh, the built environment like uh, active transportation infrastructure, as well as societal and structural environments. And so that getting at uh, things like school policies that, that are known to have an impact on physical activity. Uh, and then just a final note that although at the initial stages of our indicator selection, we sought to ensure that indicators were selected at every level and across all these domains, we didn't limit ourselves for our final product or, or restrict ourselves to being balanced across all these areas. So while cognizant, it was not a factor that, uh, that we necessarily held to through to the end. Uh, at about the same time that we were developing our conceptual frame, we also identified our selection criteria. We drew a lot of expertise from the work that was done to develop our chronic disease and injury indicator framework, uh, as well as the positive mental health indicator framework. So if any of you who were, uh, uh, have seen some of the development work in those, you'll recognize probably this exact slide. Uh, but the key uh, factor or the key selection criteria that we wanted to apply, first and foremost, evidence. Uh, 
uh, and ensuring that there is a strong body of evidence linking each indicator to either physical activity, sedentary behavior, or sleep. Uh, secondly, relevance. Uh, and again, to be sure that an indicator would provide information that would be highly salient uh, for understanding physical activity, sedentary behavior, or sleep behaviors or patterns in Canada. Uh, Second, Karen, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt again. Bill, I'm sorry, but we've lost the connectivity to chat here, so we're not able to, I don't know what happened, but we're not able to um, kind of keep track of questions that are coming in. Okay. Well, I can do that, and I'll send. Um, I don't know if you have access to email there, but I could send you an email if you need, uh, or I can share the questions part. Um, either way is fine. We just have to make sure that okay. it's addressed. Yeah. Sure. sure. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, third, selection criteria, actionability, uh, and ensuring that indicators would provide information that can inform, influence, or change public health policy or practice, uh, and then finally, accuracy. Uh, and that uh, that an indicator would be scientifically sound, would be valid and reliable, sensitive to change, interpretable and complete. Uh, those factors that when we're, we're doing surveillance reporting and monitoring, it's important that the information we're providing is accurate. So back to our schematic here. Once our conceptual frame and our selection criteria were identified, we moved on to doing a rapid review of the literature. So this began with an environmental scan. Uh, we examined population-based surveys, both national, subnational. We went We also looked at international surveys, as well as scientific review articles and any existing physical activity surveillance frameworks we could identify, which were few and far between. Uh, through this process, uh, we identified a total of 193 indicators. And so for each of these indicators, we documented the evidence and, uh, and grouped them according to our conceptual framework. And this work was all with the goal of feeding into the next step in our process, uh, which was to hold a technical expert consultation as well as internal consultations. Uh, in order to refine this list and, and truly start selecting our indicators. So in June 2014, we held our first technical expert meeting. Uh, we brought in technical experts in the areas of sleep, sedentary behavior, and physical activity. And this represented uh, individuals from academia, from NGOs, as well as Sport Canada and Statistics Canada were in attendance at this meeting. Uh, the experts were asked to, first of all, we had a lot of discussion around our conceptual framework and its principles to be sure that we were on track. Uh, and then the tedious process of going through the long list of indicators, indicator by indicator, and applying the selection criteria. So at the end of this long day, but very productive day, we were left with a list of 72 indicators to move forward. Uh, after this process, we didn't stop with our 72. Our next step was to bring this set of indicators back to our own senior management and program area leads to be sure that uh, the list of indicators resonated with them, the priority areas were covered, uh, and that the work of the agency would, would be reflected in, in the indicators or at least covered by the indicators. Uh, we also went, uh, once we had consulted internally, uh, out and uh, met with Sport Canada uh, just to see how the indicators resonated there and did a, a PT consultation through the Physical Activity, Rec Physical Activity Rec and Recreation Committee, the FPT Committee, uh, with surveillance experts in the provinces and territories. So at the end of this process, we were left with 73 indicators. Uh, this was not necessarily the same, uh, or the 72 plus one, but uh, there, there were a total of 73 at the end of this step. So there was, I guess at this stage in the process, a bit of a, I don't want to say a, a lag time, but we began some work looking at our indicators, looking at measurement possibilities, looking at how we can and should present our indicators and the information so that the, the grouping of indicators would be able, would be informative. Uh, and so one thing that happened between our consultations and then our final step, which I will describe, 
was the need or our interest to discuss children and adults completely separately. So we broke our indicators apart uh, and, and uh, I guess, identified those indicators that were applicable for both adults and children, those that were unique. Uh, but we did want, as a final step in this process, to return to our expert group to do some final validation uh, of the set of indicators, as well as to prioritize a little bit those indicators where there might be gaps, where we should be focusing our efforts moving forward, uh, and to, to determine the indicators that were most important for us to be working towards reporting on first. We re-engaged the experts from our technical meeting and uh, this time did not hold a face-to-face -face meeting, but did an online consultation uh, in which the experts were asked to rank each indicator on a five-point scale uh, for its uh, relevance and actionability. Uh, the experts were also asked to look at the full set of indicators uh, and speak to or to, to rate their comprehensiveness, to identify any gaps that might exist, uh, as well as, as I mentioned, prioritizing or ranking the indicators for importance. So recognizing that 73 indicators, or when we did break it down to adults and children separately, it resulted in even more, was a, uh, too cumbersome a number. And at the end of this stage of the process, we ended up with 44 indicators for children and youth and 41 indicators for adults, and of these, 30 overlapped, so 30 of the 44, 30 of the 41 were, were the same for adults and kids, uh, and the remainder were unique. So we have 55 unique indicators at the end of this process. 27 just shows a little bit more the progression from 193 indicators down to uh, 44 and 41. And I'm going to pass over to Aaron for what I'm sure many of you are here, which is a, a first glimpse of where, what, what these indicators are. So back over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Karen. So following the process that Karen just described, I get the opportunity to, to show you the indicators that we have, uh, that have resulted from the process over the next three slides. So this first slide illustrates the surveillance indicators on physical activity for the agency. The second column you can see the indicators listed are for children and youth, and the last column uh, lists those for adults. So in addition to reporting on total amounts of physical activity, uh, we've also identified component indicators to measure the specific types and location of physical activities that are contributing to the overall physical activity amount. Examples of these include uh, physical activity that occurs at school or as part of a person's job, active play, active chores, sports participation, as well as active travel. Finally, the remaining indicators will report on the diverse risk and protective factors at the individual and environmental levels that, get, that impact a person's level of physical activity. Examples of these range from an individual's health status, their attitudes, as well as their level of physical literacy, to family and peer interactions, community norms and safety, and features of the built environment. Um, I also wanted to point out that uh, you can see that a lot of these indicators are illustrated in various colors. So the indicators in green are those for which we have a data source and we can report nationally on an ongoing basis. Indicators colored in orange are those for which we have historical data for and measures may exist, but they are not uh, collected regularly. Finally, for those colored in red, uh, there currently is no data that's, that's being collected in a standardized matter manner at the national level. Although currently the majority of nationally available data rests at the individual level, we are looking to strengthen our national surveillance system to better report on the broader environmental determinants. For sedentary behavior, the agency has followed the same structure as physical activity for indicators, where in addition to focusing on total daily sedentary time, indicators were also included to describe the type of sedentary behavior which includes uh, sedentary time spent at school and work, time spent sitting in a vehicle, as well as recreational screen time. Risk and protective indicators uh, illustrate the factors influencing sitting behavior, such as time spent outdoors, uh, uh, awareness, parenting practices in the home, the presence and access to electronic media, as well as workplace norms and policies are also listed there. 
Uh, presently, the agency reports on individual sanitary time and type. However, through PASS, we would like to work on developing measures to collect data on the various upstream determinants of sedentary behavior. And finally, we're on to the sleep indicators. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, traditionally, data collection on sleep was centered on sleep amount and sleep disorders, such as sleep apnea. Through PASS, the agency is aiming to increase its reporting to include other components of sleep, such as napping and sleep quality, as well as the various behavioral and environmental factors that can impact a good night's sleep. Examples of these factors include sleep hygiene. Um, so you can see them listed uh, as they're basically the various behaviors that uh, can impact a person's quality of sleep as well as their duration. Things like uh, the time they go to bed, uh, stress levels, physical activity, as well as caffeine consumption. Um, as some other risk and protective factors for sleep, too, include parental practices in the home, uh, electronic media in the bedroom, and levels in, of environmental noise at night. So this brings us, uh, I guess, to the end of our process. Uh, identifying our indicators is, well, by no means the end of this work, uh, but the, the, the stage that we're at now, the, the final stage, I guess, the implementation stage, uh, it just came down to identifying measures in order to report on each on our indicators, as well as developing our reporting plan, so our, our KD&E and our product plan. Uh, the work we are actively pursuing right now is identifying the best measure for each of our indicators, and that includes selecting uh, what measure will be used, what data source will be used to report on it, and always looking at our indicators as a whole, trying to ensure that we are reporting, uh, hopefully on, on many of them from a, a, a same data source, but also turning our attention to looking at new data sources for reporting. And so uh, whether that be to modify our existing surveys to better meet our data needs, to draw on administrative data sources, a lot of discussion around tapping into you know, municipal spending databases or uh, crime rates is another one that keeps coming up as something we may be able to tap into admin data for. Uh, but again, needing to ensure that the measures we get out of these data sources uh, do report on the constructs uh, that we are most interested in, in describing. Uh, and then finally, developing totally new approaches to data collection, uh, whether it be using GIS data systems, which we have not historically uh, relied on, uh, policy surveillance. Again, there's, there's a few systems emerging out there that we are certainly looking at very closely, as well as uh, looking at the potential of new technologies, social media, surveillance, wearable monitors, mobile devices, uh, many different new technologies out there that we are looking to, especially for some of the newer indicators that, as Erin mentioned, we don't currently have a national data source for. So the final slide, uh, looking a little bit towards next steps, and we are developing or hoping to be developing and actually disseminating products this year. Uh, including a process paper that's going to describe the development process, uh, which you've heard about today, as well as our first round of reporting on indicators for which we have measures available uh, and, and data available to be reporting on. Uh, reporting on the indicators is definitely a priority for us. Uh, and the, we hope that, that the data will be appearing alongside the positive mental health indicator framework as well as the chronic disease and injury indicator framework. We're also working on developing infographics that will be displaying our results, results more visually uh, as well as planning for some peer-reviewed publications. Uh, the next steps, and this is further in the future, we are hoping to be developing an online, online tool that will be allowing users to explore the data in the framework uh, broken down by sociodemographic characteristics such as age and sex as well as uh, income and immigrant status. So again, for those of you familiar with our chronic disease and injury indicator framework online tool, uh, we're thinking it will be something analogous to that. 
we do also see the past indicator framework as an evergreen document. Uh, our intention is that the content of the framework will be reviewed regularly and uh, with, a, with a continued focus on ensuring it's, it's uh, accurate and relevant, but also to inform our data development activities so that we can hopefully address data gaps and, and you know, continue to improve the measures that we're using for each of the indicators. So with that, I think comes to the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, we would, I guess, welcome any questions. Uh, we uh, please ask away, and thank you. And should you want more information, uh, please don't hesitate to contact either myself, Karen C. Roberts, or Aaron Kropak. Thanks very much, um, all of you, for your presentations. And um, we've got a few questions coming in so far. So first question from Linda is, does this data include occupation? Uh, so occupation is not an indicator per se, but it is, or it is a factor that was identified for disaggregating so that we would take into account when we were reporting on indicators, uh, recognizing I mean, occupation much the same way, sex, age group, some of those factors aren't noted explicitly in the indicator framework, but the intention would be uh, reporting according to it as appropriate. Great. Sorry, I just wanted to add, we do actually have occupational, depends how, what they mean by that, but there is a, an indicator there about occupational physical activity as well, so people who have jobs that are more active and not sitting at a cubicle all day. Okay, thanks. And our next question from Dave is, um, and I think he's referring to the slides where you were showing all the various indicators, and he's asking, he's saying outdoor time only appears under children and youth sedentary time. Why does it not appear for adults or under physical activity? Uh, so I think two questions there. There were a lot of indicators where does it best fit under sedentary behavior? Does it best fit under physical activity with the premise that a factor that might get somebody off the couch and out being active, well, is it as a, as a factor that impacts sedentary behavior or a factor that affects physical activity? So that was one we did have much discussion on uh, in terms of where it, where it fell, and I don't have the, the final decision point in front of me, uh, but it ended up fitting more or fitting better under sedentary behavior. I don't know if I'll pass to you for the... I guess we felt there was a stronger, I mean, from what we were looking at in the evidence, there's a stronger linkage between, uh, between being outdoors and sedentary behavior, really, than physical activity, uh, just because if someone's outdoors doesn't mean that they're really going to be... Uh, they're going to be doing physical activity, whereas usually if you're outdoors, uh, you're, you're not going to be sitting down. Um, in terms of children versus adults, it just seemed that most of the literature was showing most of the evidence was centered on children, and we didn't find a lot on adults. All right. And um, our next question, for another one from Linda. Do you have data about school environments such as health-promoting schools? Uh, currently, that is actually something that's reported upon in curbing childhood obesity, and so uh, drawing on that, uh, the data that is used around healthy school policies currently is coming from the Health Behavior and School Age Children Survey, which is a WHO survey, and they, as part of that, have some questions about food policies and physical activity policies in place at schools. So that is the current data used for, for those indicators. It's Gaia here. I mean, that's, that's a really, really good question because obviously in the context of the lifespan, particularly when it comes to children and youth, there's a huge chunk of time that's spent in school. And so we're very interested in, in exploring and understanding how surveillance could be best um, reported on in the context of obviously physical activity, sedentary behavior, hopefully not too much sleep happening in the schools. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that being said, I think our, our approach was probably to try and understand that, as Karen was mentioning, in the context of school policies. So a part of it, um, and it's probably, I forget, Erin, whether it was a red or a or uh, I forget the color code, whether the data are already there or being collected, but certainly we flagged it, and that's a really good one. So things that we were looking at or could be looking at in the context of school policy is, you know, policies around um, bike racks being available or around, um, 
you know, um, active transportation uh, either during school hours or to school or, or, or things like that. So we're very much um, wanting to understand that area, but also very much in uh, trying to explore what the best measure against that might be. So school policies was green in that slide, and the reason for that was through the um, uh, HBSC survey. They do collect data about schools' shared use policy, so communities having access to be able to use school equipment, school, school gym. So that's one policy that we're collecting data on, but like Gaia said, there's, there's a number of policies that we could look at in addition to that um, that can inform that supportive school environment. So the next few questions are from Paula. The first one, uh, why not include data for under three years of age, perhaps through family lifestyle and or physical family activities? Uh, I, I don't think we've, did we exclude under three? I don't think we, no. no. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was just a misperception. Uh, yeah. Our intent is not to exclude any age bracket. Like we're very committed to looking at physical activity, sedentary behavior, sleep across the lifespan. Um, and certainly, I think that uh, you know we have quite a work, um, quite our work cut out for us because yeah. I'm sure that many of you on the call are nodding your head when when it comes to data on children, particularly children less than 11 years of age, let alone less than three, five. There's a dearth of information available, especially for reporting at the national level. And so, you know, one of the areas that we're actually quite excited about in the context of data collection for, um, for the under 11-year-old age group is um, the survey which we fondly call Cheesy, but it's the Children, um, children and Youth, um, what's it, Canadian Health Survey for Children and Youth, excuse me, that should be in the field next year. So we've been very, very actively working with Stats Canada to inform some of the content of that survey, and, 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 and certainly some of that content is going to be looking at this particular area around physical activity, uh, sedentary behavior. So hopefully we'll be able to collect data directly from um, the parents or caregivers of kids who are less than 11 years old. And, and certainly, as, um, as Paula mentioned, there are proxies by way of the caregivers that we could use to, um, to better capture this information. But when it comes to data gaps, kids are, are definitely you know huge data gap area for surveillance purposes at the national level reporting. Okay, and the second question from Paula is, have you considered use of EDI data? Um, I'm not sure what she's referring to, but you may know. Um, that, and she says, physical health and well-being domain and subdomains. Yeah, absolutely. So we looked at EDI in the context of positive mental health. And so some of the work that wasn't really presented during this call here speaks to, you know, the broader work that was referenced before Karen got into Karen and Aaron got into the meat of the presentation. And so certainly in the context of um, you know, development, we're looking at um, behaviors and environments as they pertain not just to physical health, but also to um, mental health and emotional development and so on. So certainly in the context of the positive mental health framework, we've explored metrics around, um, around that using EDI. And you're absolutely right. There are certainly aspects that we could draw upon to inform the work for physical activity. And that's something that we've definitely you know, flagged for, for ourselves, not only in the context of trying to you know, keep along the lines of um, overall health is physical health and mental health, but also um, in efforts to not duplicate and to create efficiencies um, with systems and metrics that have been true and tried. Great, and thanks, um, Christine. She's noted in the chat that EDI is early development instrument. So for anyone like myself who didn't know what that was, um, there you are. Uh, so next question from Dave is, any, uh, are documents available from your lit review and expert consultations? Not. Currently, <laughs> uh, so we are working on putting together a process paper that will be describing the process in well, some detail. Um, although within that, depending on what is being sought after, there will be you know, some of the details of the lit review. Not uh, probably not all the results will fit within that paper. But uh, if you want to get in touch with us, we're happy to uh, to discuss or share as we can. 
Um, next question from Elaine is, will you be capturing information on participation in types of activities other than sport, active chores, and active transportation, for example, leisure time walking? Absolutely. Uh, and I think both for, for children in particular, we really try to capture uh, active play and that separate and distinct from sport participation. Uh, and similarly for adults, looking at you know occupational active chores, but as well as leisure time physical activity separately and distinctly from sport participation. Uh, so yes, by all means, we're trying to, to capture all the different ways that children are active and not just those that are, that are in organized, uh, organized activities. Great. I don't have any more questions on the chat, but I know, uh, Victoria, you had some questions uh, yeah. there with you. Yeah, I have some more here. Um, the first question is, will you be reporting on the indicators at the provincial level or only at the national level? So our, uh, I guess our primary goal is going to be to report at the national level. Uh, as I mentioned, we are hoping to, to be able to give users or interested parties the ability to disaggregate or to break down the indicators. And if and where possible, PT breakdowns will be one of those disaggregations that we will allow for or that we will certainly make, uh, make available. But the intention is primarily to report at the national level. Uh, next question is, uh, are you using walk score for walkability? Do you want to speak to that? Or to... You go ahead. And... Okay. Um, so that is a measure that we're still working towards. We've, uh, we actually had a student working with us this fall. I don't know what month we're in. This fall, uh, who did a bit of a review of the various uh, tools or instruments out there for looking at walkability. So we have a lot of food for thought on that one, and uh, we haven't yet done the, the final synthesis to determine what that measure will be, but walk score was certainly one of the, the metrics that he examined. And next question is, what do you mean by baseline data available? Um, by that, we mean that in the past it was collected, but it's no longer uh, being collected on a regular basis at the national level. Or there's been a break in time series yes. that we might need to overcome. So it, it uh, represents a little bit more uncertainty about where the data will be coming from. Okay. And how does this framework link to the healthy weights? So that's a really, really good question. Obviously, in the context of um, physical activity, we all, you know, all of us are, are aware that there are direct linkages when it comes to outcomes um, as they pertain to healthy weights. A part of the work that we're interested in from a surveillance perspective is certainly to try and understand the metrics as they pertain to, in this case, physical activity, but also um, with respect to healthy weights, the metrics that pertain to healthy weights. So part of the work that the group is doing is, um, is in first, you know, working along the program lens, but it's becoming apparent as we move along this process that there are, and not surprisingly, there will be other indicators that are similar, if not the same, when it comes to um, whether it's reporting on physical activity or whether it's reporting on, on healthy weight. So for example, something like the built environment in the context of supportive environments is certainly something that Karen and Erin have highlighted in the context of physical activity. But as our work progresses on, on healthy weights, it's, um, it's more than likely going to be highlighted as an area um, to, to explore further as well. So um, a part of our discovery as we kind of go along this, um, this, this journey is that you know, we're identifying those types of indicators that make sense to apply across the board regardless of outcome of interest, and by outcome, in this case, I mean physical activity or sedentary behavior or sleep, um, and that there are, in fact, at times, um, parallels or overlaps, which then allow us to, again, create some efficiencies when it comes to data collection and reporting. Okay. And the final question I have is, how often do you plan to report on these indicators? Um, so our hope is to be able to update uh, our, our web the web tool, the web interface, it's not yet a tool, 
on an annual basis by recognizing not all our data sources, actually most of our data sources are not annual. So uh, we plan to report at least once a year on any new indicators. I guess that would be the, the simplest way to... On any new data. On any new data, sorry. Yeah. yeah. But but just to add to what Karen was saying, I'm conscious of the time as well, but um, you know, the intent is to continuously, whether we're reporting on new data or not, and that depends on whether there are new data available to report on, our intent is definitely to keep this, um, this approach and, and the documentation evergreen, because we know the evidence moves, the evidence grows, and so we want to be as relevant and as up-to-date. So even if there might not be a reporting, our intent is to definitely keep revisiting this work so that it does reflect the latest available evidence. Okay, I think that's it for the questions from my end here. Great, thanks. And uh, so it's Bill here, um, but uh, maybe I'll turn it over to our presenters if you have any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with our attendees before we sign off. Thanks, Bill. It's, it's Gaia here. I think that, um, first of all, again, thank you all very much for taking the time to, uh, to join us during the presentation. I think that you'll agree that there's some of this work which is, um, which is relatively um, new, uh, at least for us, and so we're very interested in hearing from you if you have suggestions and thoughts on how we could um, move forward uh, together. I also, I think we also recognize that granularity of information is extraordinarily important, especially when it comes to program and programming for sure, uh, and policy development as, as a secondary perhaps. Um, and, and so, you know, we're very interested in learning about the types of data that might be out there that allow for a roll-up because we do want to be putting out information that's relevant. Certainly from our mandate perspective, it's at the national level. But to the extent that we can have breakdowns available so that it's more meaningful for, for colleagues across Canada at whatever level you might be, that's really the direction we want to be going. So, so if there are any thoughts or, or you know, suggestions that you have, please, please do get in touch with Karen and Erin with, with those. So, um, I don't know, Karen, Erin, if you have other thoughts here, but um, they're, they're shaking their heads. <laughs> so back to you, Bill. Great. Well, thanks very much. Um, thanks to all of you, um, uh, to Victoria, our moderator, and to Gaia and Karen and Aaron for uh, for presenting today. It's been really interesting, and uh, hopefully it's been uh, interesting for our uh, participants on the line as well. And thanks for leaving your, um, your emails as well in case anyone wants to get in touch with you. That's really great. So uh, we do look forward to hearing updates and hearing more as this develops and, uh, and um, hearing some more about your, uh, your future work and the online uh, pieces. That's going to be really fascinating to see. So hopefully we can bring you back for another webinar in the future. Um, and of course, we're going to be continuing on with our webinar series throughout the year. So stay tuned and watch your inboxes and, uh, and keep an eye out for the upcoming webinars in this series. So uh, that's it. So thanks very much and uh, hope everyone has a great day. Bye everyone.